Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have with us Tim Boma and Dave Roberts. They work for the Government of Canada as digital identity um, consultants and um, very well known in the space in Canada and also on a global stage. And they are the authors of the Pan Canadian Trust Framework, which is one of the key pieces that gives um, the whole SSI space uh, a, a whole foundation about how to do SSI. Um, from the highest level all the way to the, to the most detailed level. So really happy to have them with us today. This is a special identity book dot info special, which is the work that we're working on with Drum and Reed and myself um, and many other of the leading thinkers about um, digital identity and SSI. Um, and you can follow us at Identity Book HQ. And um, we're just going to review quickly in the next slide what SSI Meetup is about before we jump into the details of what Dave and, and Tim will be presenting. So um, SSI Meetup, uh, uh, for those that never joined us before, um, is about empowering global SSI communities. This is open to everyone. If you're an individual, an association, a, com uh, a company around the world, you can reuse this material. It's all shared with the Creative Commons by Share Like License, which basically means you can reuse this material as with uh, any other open source license. Please just give credit back to the authors. Today, this is Tim and Dave, and also please tell us how media when you use it. This is being widely used around the world, so we're really happy with the results. Um, as uh, as you know, if you joined previous SSI meetup sessions, um, it's um, we're really surprised about how how popular this has become around the world. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask your questions during the presentation. During the presentation, I'll bring those questions up to Dave and Tim. Um, and if um, and if if not, we wait all the way to the end. Okay. So I think that covers everything. And um, Tim and Dave, uh, welcome so much to SSI Meetup again. It's great to have you with us. Great. Uh, uh, thanks for having us, Alex. And Dave, you're on the line there as well? I am. Oh, there we go. Bit of a bit of a delay, but I'm sure that uh, uh, we'll work through that. So, again, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. As Alex was saying, this is a special edition, so to speak, because we are finalizing our chapter in the Manning Early Access Program, early access program uh, like for self-sovereign identity. I think the chapter went up on the um, up on the website uh, just uh, just a couple a couple of weeks ago or so, and I'm just going to very quickly jump out of the presentation and just show you where it is on the website. So there's the Manning, uh, uh, Manning Books um, website there, Self-Sovereign Identity. Um, just scrolling down, you can see the various chapters um, that have been uh, uh, added to the Early Access um, Program. And here's the one on Canada enabling self-sovereign identity. Click on it, you'll be able to see the content. So really uh, what, what Dave and I will be doing is give you, be giving you a preview of um, what we put in this chapter, uh, what we wrote about in, in terms of the Canadian context, but also we'll be talking about uh, uh, the latest and greatest of the, the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, uh, the public sector profile version 1.1, which we just put up on GitHub last week on Thursday. So um, we're going to uh, go through the presentation here. Uh, let me get back to presentation mode, and I presume everybody can see it. And we will start to talk about the Canadian context, and then we'll start drilling down into the, the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework itself. Again, a lot of this text is actually pulled right from the, from the chapter, and uh, uh, we just want to give you a sense of uh, uh, what we've been doing in Canada, and we just uh, give you a good sense of the the starting point. This journey has been going on for a number of years, decades, if you will. I, I got involved in uh, identity back in about 2005 with the federal government and have been working with the, not only with the, the Canadian government, but also the other uh, governments of Canada, namely the provinces and the territories, to come up with what we've called a, um, a pan-Canadian approach. And, you know, this is pretty self-evident. Uh, I think, uh, you know, identity is at the core of most government business processes and is a starting point of trust and confidence in interactions between people and the government. And for many services, uh, such as social benefits, issuance of a passport, driver's license, healthcare, you know, the government needs to know who you are, not not to surveil you or anything like that, but actually to provide you with, with good service. And um, I, I just try to depict uh, uh, in this diagram what we are trying to do with it within Canada. Like, I think uh, one of the key things is that 
Um, you know, we're 14 jurisdictions in total, uh, one federal, uh, uh, 10 provinces and three territories. And while we're like uh, 14 separate jurisdictions, we, you know, we have a, a very a mobile population that tra works and travels across the, uh, across the country. And we want to be able to not only work within a, a Canadian federation, but also enable individuals to move freely about the country. So this is just a, a, an approximation of an individual having no, no borders within the country of Canada. And really just showing that on one side you have issuers or governments that actually provide trusted information. On the other side you have verifiers, could be other government institutions, but also could be um, the commercial uh, sector as well. So that's just a, a simple simple diagram just to kind of show where, where, where we're going. Uh, the Canadian approach and policy yeah. framework Tim, sorry to interrupt. And I think maybe it's, it, there's a lot of background noise. Maybe it's from Dave's device. Maybe Dave, you can mute yourself while while Tim is talking. I think it's coming from there. And maybe some um, feedback from. Just as soon as I figure out how to do it on my Android, it's not intuitive. <laughs> okay, okay. Now it's good. All right. Okay. So um, I'll just talk about the Canadian approach and policy framework. You know, the adoption of the self-sovereign identity model within the Canadian public sector, it's still being realized. It's a still a work in progress. Um, we've been introducing, um, not only through our policy frameworks, but with the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, we're, we've been changing the conversation, so to speak. Um, we're, uh, we're introducing new concepts like issuer, verifier, holder, et cetera and really uh, uh, imbuing a new model of how to address this problem of identity management, digital identity, and more generally, uh, digital trust and verifiable credentials. You know, it's still early days in the space. It's too early to tell how it's gonna change the, the technological infrastructure or the, or more importantly, where my focus is, the institutional infrastructure of Canadian public services. We, you know, traditionally we've been, uh, as, as a federation, um, the, the powers and authorities have been very uh, separated and siloed, so to speak, uh, you know, the Westminster model. And we've been very hard at work at making sure that we can actually provide like seamless uh, government uh, experiences across um, different levels of government. But, you know, things like legislation, regulations, so on and so forth, still have to follow. We, we, we bump up into institutional and authority lines. And as I said, this has not been an overnight process. It's been a deliberate, a phased and incremental approach over the past decade. Some of you may be aware that back in um, 2008, we embarked upon what we called cyber authentication renewal. We had a, a in effect on a proprietary authentication system that we needed to uh, get out and uh, updated it with a standards-based uh, cyber authentication infrastructure which we have in place and we focus on what we call at that time anonymous credentials. And now we're moving into what we've been calling a trusted digital identity. Um, also, the Government of Canada policy outcomes for identity management have been developed long before the emergence of self-sovereign identity. And we've been very careful in making sure that our policy requirements or desired outcomes or expected outcomes are general enough to enable not only the adoption of SSI and those concepts, but now we're seeing uh, a more generalized model around uh, uh, digital trust. The, uh, the other thing that we've done and been very careful about is making sure that our policy requirements are technology agnostic. We know that there's like traditional legacy centralized systems that are out there, there's federated systems, and then the newer decentralized models based on distributed ledgers, they're, they're coming to the fore. But we've been uh, very careful on making sure that our policy requirements are, 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 are technology agnostic. So uh, what is the pan canadian Trust Framework? Um, in a nutshell, in its most current version, it supports the acceptance and mutual recognition of digital identities. That has been our primary focus, digital identities of persons and also um, uh, organizations. And we're also exploring the notion of digital relationships that is between persons like guard guardians, for example, between organizations and officer of an organization, and are, 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 I mean, between organizations like ownership, et cetera, and between persons and organizations like officers or proprietors, et cetera. We've been very careful in developing uh, the framework that it is technology agnostic. You'll see that later on, um, that what we've developed uh, enables not only the legacy systems to be articulated within the framework, but also 
enables us to adopt the emerging uh, emerging technologies and the approaches. Uh, most importantly, it allows for the interoperability of different platforms, services, and architectures and technologies. And we see this uh, enabling us to uh, transition from legacy identity technologies, which identity management technologies, which will still be there for a long time, if not maybe another generation, but also uh, to be able to coexist with uh, within SSI in, in the public sector more broadly with the uh, uh, commercial sector as well. So that that's been the aim. As as I said er, earlier on, uh, this is a long-term change approach and. We have to work with a multiplicity of actors, multiplicity of systems. Uh, in some countries, it's pretty straightforward. It can be centralized systems or through a single authority. That is not the case in, in Canada. We have to work with a, a, a variety of actors. Um, just to give you an idea where we're at, uh, I talked about this earlier. Uh, the consultation draft, uh, version 1.1, uh, we did finalize that on June 7th, uh, June 2nd, uh, only a few days ago. It is posted on GitHub for broader consultation and review. We haven't decided what the review period is, but uh, we're pretty happy with it, uh, what we've done um, with uh, the public uh, the public sector. Uh, we posted a, a year ago, I think it was July 7th, uh, version 1.0, uh, which is also still up there, if you want to look at the, the, the Delta. And we started immediately after that, started to work on version 1.1. And I, th I think if you had a chance to look at it, I haven't had a chance to go back, but uh, we've significantly tightened things up. We've streamlined um, the the uh, uh, the document itself. We've we've been very careful to make sure that the language, all the language in there, counts. Like there's no what I call word salad or superfluous descriptions. Um, we've removed all of that. And we're just taking a like a, a bit of a break right now with the public sector and. Um, We'll be restarting uh, some work uh, uh, shortly. We've identified like 11 thematic issues. We haven't figured everything out, but um, uh, we recognize that there needs to be some focused work on understanding digital relationships, informed consent, unregistered organizations. Um, amongst uh, those are three amongst of the 11 um, uh, uh, conform uh, uh, 11 thematic issues, and we're thinking about striking up um, uh, some uh, working groups on that. Uh, accompanying the, the trust framework is an assessment worksheet. It's basically a spreadsheet where we've consolidated all of the conformance criteria. I think we have uh, about 400 in total. Uh, we're in the process of integrating organizational conformance criteria, which may be a separate worksheet. And there's continued refinement and, and, and validation of the conformance criteria. We're also starting to work on uh, what we call an assessment and mutual recognition process. We've done it twice with the province of Alberta and with the province of BC, and we are iterating that uh, to see how that could evolve into a formalized uh, program. We're doing it from our point of view, from Treasury Board Secretariat. I work for the Government of Canada to meet our policy needs, but um, we want to see if we can generalize that and perhaps maybe move that in, in, into a program that's uh, outside of the, the Government of Canada. It could be a, a pan-Canadian program, it could be an international program. And we're also exploring alignment with uh, other frameworks, EIDAS, uh, Digital Nations, you know, there's the Australian Trust uh, Framework as well. A lot of countries are actually developing uh, their own uh, frameworks. Uh, on the next slide, the PCTF model. Uh, you know, this is a very simple uh, block diagram of the major pieces. Um, we have what's called the normative core. Um, which are those pieces of the trust framework that we expect to become a standard. And there is some other work happening within Canada with the CIO Strategy Council that's basically taking that material and writing a, or drafting a national standard. And um, you'll see the components in there. I'll, I'll touch upon a few of them uh, a little bit later, like identity domains, digital represent representation, so on and so forth. Uh, the second part is the mutual recognition component. That's off to the right-hand side. Um, that's really the methodology for doing a formal uh, assessment process. It's not that different than a security and assessment authorization or certification and accreditation or what the, uh, what the European Union calls like a notification process with the uh, EU regulations. It's basically we've taken what we've learned, we've, we've put it in the trust framework. A lot of the material is an appendix, but it's really... Um, uh, trying to formalize the due diligence process. Uh, underneath that, you'll see the supporting infrastructure. We recognize that um, the trust framework 
is enabled by uh, not only specific products and services, but also existing infrastructure that uh, uh, exists out there. And uh, there may be some new capabilities that need to be built that uh, can serve the trust framework, but necessarily don't need to be um, managed by government, if you will, it can be done by the private sector. And, the, and then finally, the digital ecosystem roles and inf information flows. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, we, we uh, 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 I guess, drew heavily from the W3C standard on verifiable credentials and looked at that. Uh, some of you may be aware of like issuers, holders, verifiers, et cetera. And we've articulated that in a way that it can be actually uh, adopted in an institutional context. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I just want to call out identity domains. This was one of the uh, key issues that we needed to really address within the Canadian context. <clears throat> you as an individual, that you exist, um, and the, the claim that you exist, basically is a responsibility of, of government. And um, we wanted to make sure that as you, you as a real individual, uh, and you may be manifesting yourself digitally, that we, for the purposes of our services, can actually trace you back to a, a foundational event. And um, that, that final foundational event in the Canadian context for organization, for people is vital statistics organizations, those that register the births and um, deaths of individuals. That That's a um, responsibility of the provinces and territories. It's not of the federal government. It's, uh, it's uh, basically in their legislation. We rely on it, as federally speaking. For businesses, it's the registries of the provinces and territories. For immigration, people coming into Canada, that is a federal responsibility. Um, so we do, uh, I, I like to call IRCC immigration as of the 14th jurisdiction for people. And then you also have federal federal uh, registry of corporations of Canada. So the idea here is that those, those foundational identities of persons and organizations it is a government responsibility, um, but again, in Canada, it is distributed across different levels of government. Then we have this notion of a contextual identity. Um, it's it's used for a specific purpose, like banking, business permits, health services, driver's licensing, social media. And there's many different contexts that you exist in, which you have identity. Um, the issue that we had here was, uh, you know, there was this, you know, desire to take a contextual identity whether it's from banking or health and say this is good as your foundational identity and um, there's an issue with that because ultimately it actually has to be tied back to your foundational identity so there is a role of government to play in the first place um, we do want to rely on the commercial sector uh, to pro provide us with services but as i said um, earlier there are some key responsibilities of government that you exist that really need to remain within the uh, uh, domain of government. And, and we just came up with, a, a, we, we developed those terms to really clarify the difference. Um, digital representations, uh, we've recognized two broad classes, digital identity uh, of persons and organizations and, and digital relationships uh, between, between individuals and organizations, so on and so forth. We haven't figured out exactly how to model the, the digital relationships. We have some good ideas, but, um, we're thinking that that might be um, just modeled within the verifiable credential. And Dave, um, my colleague, has been working on that. That's one of the discussion papers that we're working on post version 1.1. And uh, the, other, the other point that I want to make is um, we're finding that this model is very generic. And um, this model could easily be extended to digital assets, smart contracts. It could also... Uh, expand in terms of like recognition of uh, academic credentials, professional designations, so on and so forth. We may have to revise or, or extend different what we call atomic processes, but we're finding the model generic and robust enough to actually expand to many other use cases. Uh, again, I apologize for the wordiness of this, but um, and again, just pulling material out of the uh, uh, out of the um, the document. This is the core piece of the, the trust framework, uh, the atomic process model. We modeled the identity management functions as what we call atomic uh, uh, processes, like a state transition function. There's an input state and an output state, and there's conformance criteria in the middle that enable the transition from that input state to output state. 
uh, it sounds very dry and very pedantic, but uh, I, I think you, you can see the value when you're actually doing a due diligence of a program and really trying to understand what they're doing, that these atomic processes are very helpful in enabling you to map and articulate what's actually going on within a program. I think at last count, we had 29 uh, atomic processes defined. I'll give you a flavor of that a little bit later. And this is where the due diligence comes in, where we look at a program, and again, just from the experience that we've gained from assessing a province, a lot of these functions um, uh, have evolved over time, if not decades, and are actually carried out between different institutions and agencies within a jurisdiction. In, in some countries, sure, it may be just a central identity agency, um, may do all these functions, um, but we, what we discovered that uh, there may be the driver's licensing folks, there's health, uh, there could be some commercial providers, there could be some other uh, coordinating authorities, and then then again, when you get to the federal level, it's the same thing over again. So I think we've we've come up with a pretty pretty good model to actually understand how identity is actually generated within a context and then shared across or relied on uh, across different contexts. Uh, some examples of atomic processes, uh, again, identity information validation, credential verification, consent registration. You'll see the input states, unconfirmed identity information to confirmed identity information. What you'll find um, when you read through this, I, I have a feeling that a lot, uh, many of you will go, aha, when we talk about authentication, Authentication is actually what we call a composite process. Are you authenticating the information? Are you authenticating that the holder is indeed presenting their own information? Are you authenticating a document? Are you authenticating the information on the document? Uh, where we've seen in practice a lot of confusion around um, terms like enrollment, registration, authentication, verification, validation, not that they're wrong in the different business contexts, it's just they're used a little bit a little bit differently in each context. So we've actually looked, taken a hard look at all those business processes and terminology and have broken it down into these atomic processes. Uh, we also recognize dependencies. Um, while we recognize that these atomic processes can be carried out in different um, <coughs> different organizations or different institutions, there may be uh, dependencies in terms of sequencing. So for example, if you establish identity, meaning you, you're creating a record of identity, before you can do that, you have to do what's called identity resolution. Identity resolution is ensuring you have a unique individual within your population and that you have sufficient information to uniquely identify that individual. Um, the other second type of dependency is reliance on external organizations for the provision of these atomic uh, process outputs. It sounds very technical, but the idea is, for example, if you're born in Nova Scotia and you move to Alberta and you present your birth certificate to get uh, a My Alberta digital ID, in effect, Alberta is relying on the process, the registration process from, from Nova Scotia. And uh, we just, um, it's not it's not like we're calling it out or anything like that. We're just making it more explicit to say, oh, there's a huge reliance between jurisdictions and we at least want to note that uh, uh, in our assessment process. Similarly, uh, people coming into Canada as immigrants, for example, uh, when they uh, take up residence with a pro within a province, they're reliant on the registration process from, from immigration. So we're just really clarifying a lot of these dependencies that are kind of, you know, not ignored, but just kind of taken for granted, and we're making that um, very uh, specific now. Uh, supporting infrastructure, we recognize that the trust framework and a digital identity solutions exists within yet a larger uh, digital ecosystem, and um, we, the experience that we have had with our provincial assessments that the the assessment process that we've done is usually one of many streams of work that need to be done. And usually it's around negotiating service level agreements, uh, user experience, um, there's the uh, technical integration, privacy impact assessment, security assessment authorizations. And then there's other things about how like it's technically integrated uh, and what standards are being used from, 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 from a technical standpoint. They don't impact the, uh, the assessment process per se, 
but they are important, absolutely important in the larger context of a, uh, a integration project, especially between uh, two jurisdictions, namely like the federal and provincial government. Uh, conveyance of process output states. Uh, the other thing that we, I think we've been successful at is very clearly separating the concerns of generating a, uh, an output state from an atomic process, like the result of an identity verification that we have, uh, that we've confirmed that it's the right individual expressing their information. How that gets conveyed across the ecosystem is there are many ways it can be done with a, a traditional API call. It can be done with a peer-to-peer -peer technology. It can be done via a trusted third party or federated identity provider. It can be done by a distributed ledger. Uh, so we've, we've made it very clear that um, we're, we're mostly concerned with the integrity of the processes and how that's actually conveyed across the ecosystem may take one or several um, uh, methods of doing it. Uh, and an example, you know, with traditional integrations, we've used security assessment markup language. We have a per particular profile on that. Then there's Open ID, Open ID Connect is another way of uh, conveying this information. But what's coming on the horizon now is uh, verifiable credentials and digital wallets. Uh, but all of those things, what's in common is that you actually have to trust those claims. You have to trust the processes that minted those verifiable credentials or generated that secure assertion markup uh, language, that, that assertion. And that's the primary concern of the PCTF is to focus on, you know, the legitimacy or the, inter the integrity of those claims. Um, this diagram here, the digital ecosystem and information flows. Uh, this has gone through quite a few iterations. And in fact, we have to update our um, uh, uh, a diagram in the, the, the Manning, Manning book because uh, after numerous consultations, we, we've had to uh, revise this. And this is basically a, a, a generalized representation of um, the issuer holder verifier model that really started to gain traction with the uh, W3C standard. And, and maybe, Dave, I'm a bit tired of talking. Maybe I'll hand it over to you to talk to uh, this model for a few minutes. And there may be questions come up with this. This is where we've had a lot of discussion. So maybe I'll hand it over to you to, to talk, about, talk about it. some of the assumptions that we've challenged and are addressing as, as we speak. Um, well, uh, I guess what I'd say is that although on the surface this looks very similar to what you'll find in the uh, W3C data model 1.0. It's, it, it's, it's at a higher level because what they're dealing with is, is explicitly the, uh, the generation, the handling of claims, the generation of credential, and the presentation uh, to a verifier. <clears throat> we use the same terminology, but I think what, what's key here is that you'll notice that the flow a labeled credential is exactly that. It's not a verifiable credential. So what we're saying here is, is that a legacy system that in fact still produces plastic or paper credentials fits in this model. Um, but the concept is, is that a credential, and, and I guess what we have to distinguish is between the, the content and the container. Many of the atomic processes that Tim has um, talked about are, are dealing with the um, quality of the identity information uh, that the issuer um, has and the, the various processes that they've undertaken to ensure the quality of that information. Um, it tends to then get conveyed to other parties via some form of credential. Uh, and it could be a piece of plastic, it could be a, uh, um, a, a passport. Um, and, and that is put into the hands of a holder. And, and then in this model, the holder then presents that credential or set of credentials to a verifier. The verifier will ask, well, I need to see a driver's license 
and a birth certificate. So the holder then presents that those two artifacts to the verifier, and the verifier uses some means of confirming the correctness. So in a physical world, this may involve uh, evaluating various security features to ensure that the credentials haven't been tampered with in some way, um, that uh, the photo on it is accurate and it too hasn't been tampered with. There may be other electronic security features. But the bottom line is we're trying to avoid uh, what the W3C would get into is the actual means of verification of the credential would be using a, a, a cryptographic methodology, which gets us to the green box, methods. So methods covers a whole spectrum of, of, of techniques and whatnot that have evolved uh, over the years that organizations use to both create credentials and to verify them in some way, to affirm their uh, their truthiness, if you will. So that this diagram that we're looking at, if you go back to the last slide, Tim, is essentially meant to convey the notion that organizations have been doing this for years, ever since paper was invented. I, I once in a podcast with Tim suggested that the uh, letters of introduction that Marco Polo presented to the Emperor Kublai Khan can fit into this model. And uh, that's precisely why we did it. So it's a very high level abstraction over a fundamental process, which is uh, creating identity, um, uh, ensuring the content around that identity is as good as it can be so that the issuer will, will back it. And then that that content is conveyed normally through some form of credential. So I won't say any more. I say I think that generally uh, explains what, what we're trying to convey here. Yeah, that, that's great, Dave. And I think uh, I'll just go back to the methods. Um, it, it took us a while to come up with this notion, and we, we might even still change the name. But I think uh, the green box really enca encapsulates what we're looking for. A again, is a concept that. Uh, enables us to map in those traditional forms of credentials, whether it's uh, letters of induction, introduction to Kublai Khan or your passport or paper thing. But really, at the at the end of the day, we're looking at the set of rules that govern things like data models, communication protocols, cryptographic algorithms, databases, distributed ledgers, verifiable data registries, that's a new term that's been coming up in similar schemes, or combinations of these. Uh, it, it enables us to actually as, as governments, if you will, to be able to entertain um, maybe multiple options at the same time. And then we also said that methods also include systems that may be isolated, um, may not have connectivity or intermittent connectivity. Um, within, within the context of digital uh, uh, ecosystem methods enable actors to interact directly. If you have central databases, that's the way it's always been done, or indirectly. Um, uh, with one another without either our party being bound to a particular solution or technology. So it, just that notion of methods, that green box gives us uh, the ability to be, you know, one of the goals of the trust framework is to be technology agnostic. So when some, someone says, you know, we've got the greatest blockchain technology or uh, distributed ledgers or decentralized identity, um, we can say, great, um, but that that may need to work in conjunction with other systems, not to the exclusion of that we already have in place. And as you know, especially governments, we have legacy systems that have been around for a long time, will be there uh, 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 for a long time, and we have to enable uh, those to exist while these new technologies or approaches take hold. And really the, the key thing is the mental model. And uh, just going to the next slide, mapping to existing roles. You know, you know, a good model is doing a job, doing its job when it actually uh, starts to simplify things. Uh, when we started this, uh, um, especially with this version, uh, I guess version 1.0, the the discussion that we had about digital ecosystems was a pretty unruly melange of roles and titles and different technology providers. And uh, so we actually took, we literally took took the like the wholesale renovation approach to that uh, section 
and we found that we could take all these terms that, that have been around for years, like authoritative party, identity insurance provider, identity proofing service provider, you go on, uh, you just the list goes on. We could roll that into the notion of an issuer. And similarly, like subject is basically a person, organization, device, holders, the uh, identity owner, card holder, which is uh, more, more in the traditional payments world, verifier, relying party, authentication service provider, so on and so forth. And then finally, methods is basically whoever might be the infrastructure provider or network provider, or you know there may be other variety of service providers. So we find that we can actually map um, that very diverse set of um, like actors in like ecosystems that evolved over the last uh, while, we can map it into this more uh, general model. Uh, and I think, thing... uh, Tim, before we go on, I would just say, if you go back to that, um, uh, not all of those actors that are listed in the right-hand side of the box may ne necessarily be full-blown issuers, but the role that they are actually uh, taking, the, the little piece that they're doing is an issuer role. It, 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 it may not be issuing the final credential, um, but they're a, a cog in the wheel, so to speak, of the issuer role. And that was one of the problems we had was, um, uh, is a credential assurance provider an issuer? Not a not in in totality, but they're an element in the issuer role. So it was a way of being able to slot these myriad names and labels that organizations and service providers had stuck on themselves and putting them into the appropriate bucket of what what is their primary role. So and and I think that helped uh, the discussion. Uh, I would also say one other thing uh, that you mentioned earlier about um, our partners and their legacy systems. Um, we adopted that information flow model and role model also so that we could all end up speaking a, com a more common language to get them to think about themselves in these terms, no matter how old their legacy system is, they should be able to see themselves uh, performing uh, one of these roles, whether or not they're using the latest and greatest technology. And that was key. We, we, we didn't want to present something that seemed to imply that, uh, well, uh, you can't really participate on, 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 unless you're fully embracing SSI or whatever, you know. So it was partly a, a communication function but also a, an encouragement for them that, uh, yeah, they may have some old systems and some old methodologies, um, but it's still fundamentally the same set of tasks that they have to address. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I, I would say that these four roles here are like the, the, uh, the, pr the principal roles and other things can be delegated out. So, for example, uh, to take the passport example, Passport Canada, uh, as part of immigration is the issuer of the passport but the actual credential itself like the physical passport is actually produced by a Canadian banknote a vendor and they may uh, I don't know the specific arrangement but they, they may actually do the credential issuance in their facility but at the end of the day Passport Canada is the issuer of the passport so um, we've really uh, clarified that like the the issuer is really responsible for the integrity of the claims and that they reflect uh, the true state of affairs of the whole uh, of, of the subject but then they may delegate those processes out to be carried out by like another department or agency or by a commercial provider and as i said when we went through um like provincial assessments uh for example one province there was 10 organizations at play not only the the ministry that was coordinating everything, but there was like, I think four or five uh, commercial providers doing anything from like sending out the cards, uh, doing the uh, doing the video verification to um, like, uh, uh, or being a crown corporation uh, on behalf of the, the crown. But it really boiled down and we could, we could trace it back to these four uh, principal roles, if you will. And, um, as, as I said, you know you got a good model when you when you have uh, 
complex or more, more accurately complicated stuff and you can actually map it into a, a simple model. Um, you know, in, in, in looking to the future, what's also emerged, um, you may be aware of the Trust over IP stack. Um, uh, we've been tracking that quite closely too, and we find that the PCTF model fits really nicely in this. So for example, layer four, I think I think this has changed a little bit since uh, we prepared the slide. The layer four is more around, is more around the human trust aspect, and that's really, um, you know, the, it maps to the normative core, the mutual recognition process. Then you get into layer three, which is more of the credential exchange, the verifiable uh, credentials. That's where the digital ecosystem roles uh, play in. And then you start getting into the more gnarly technical stuff like uh, layer two and layer one, like the DIDCOM, DID registries, there's other technologies, and that really fits into the supporting infrastructure. What, what this model does, it makes it very clear, like from a government point of view, um, we can really focus on layer four and then let um, let the industry or the, um, really figure out layer one through layer three. We may have an interest on specifying certain characteristics like uh, what might be a distributed ledger system, what would be desirable for, for government and uh, what might be our requirements, but we can actually keep those discussions at those, those layers. And, you know, it's just early days on those discussions, but at least now uh, it's not being, um, the, the, the trustworthiness of the issuers um, from a department or a program point of view is a separate issue from how you actually convey those convey those credentials. Uh, again, here's another busy diagram we prepared for some high level briefings. We get questions of how does this all fit in with the with the standards that are out there. And just the key takeaway here is that on the federal side, we have our own legislative and policy stack. You see legislation policies, directive standards, guidelines. You know, that's what I'm quite familiar with. The provinces have their own, and there's lots of differences between them, notionally the same, but we notice that there's variation. There are variations like with uh, privacy and security, so on and so forth. So, you know, the the, the public sector profile of the pan Canadian Trust Framework is really focused on be able, being able to assess against those policies and, or against the against those frameworks. And we, we do that federally. We have our own directives, um, Directive on Identity Management, our own standards, which we take the PCTF and then show that it actually meets our own, our own um, policy requirements. Uh, a province or territory would do the same, but at the end of the day, they can all use the same assessment tool. And I think at the bottom, you can see it where we say, um, you know, our, the focus of what we're doing with the public sector profile is around pro program in, in integrity. It's really um, to focus on the needs of the, the public sector for trust and confidence. That's the ultimate thing that we have as governments is that we have to uh, en engender the trust and confidence of Canadians. And um, whereas like uh, we, we have other organizations, for example, uh, DIAC that's working on um, a, the, the, another version uh, or a profile of the pan Canadian Trust Framework, a lot of the focus and rightly so is really geared around products and services, um, really private sector driven, which is perfectly fine to standardize products and services. We have an interest as governments to make sure that those are standardized as possible because we're in effect, we're building like a, a new utility. Like, uh, you know, these kind of debates went on with uh, the development of the electrical grid, uh, the communications grid. And now we're, we're getting into this uh, um, new realm of a digital identity grid, however that might play out or a digital trust, trust grid. Um, but uh, there, there's an interest to make sure that we have standards uh, uh, that we can rely on that actually are going to provide a fair and competitive uh, marketplace. And so we're seeing some really good stuff with the W3C and with the Trust Over IP Foundation. There's a few other things as well. Um, and then that leads me to the third part, which is the um, other trust frameworks, EIDAS. So actually, I have a call right after this with the Digital Nations to speak about this. Uh, how how could we align to EIDAS? Um, and also, like Australia has come out with their uh, trust framework as well. There's other international organizations like uh, Kantara. And we're, we're just trying to sort that out as we speak. Up at the top, um, the, the interesting thing is, especially in Canada, 
we don't really have like a, a national standard, so to speak, with uh, digital identity. Um, it's uh, because we have federal, provincial jurisdictions and uh, territorial jurisdictions. There's some good work being done by the CIO Strategy Council of, of coming up with a, a quote unquote voluntary national standard that it's drawing upon our work. And uh, my hope is, is that we have something that we can apply our PCTF. And then if it's good, it may, um, uh, other organizations might have a look at it and you see at the top, like uh, we, we've had discussions with uh, uh, not specific ISO, we're aware of ISO, but OECD, World Economic Forum, World Bank. Um, another one is I, ID for Africa. There's a lot of um, global organizations that are <coughs> looking at doing this for other countries. I'm just mindful of, I, I talked about this uh, and you can read it in the slides. I think it'll be available afterwards. We've done Alberta, we've done BC. We're starting to talk about the rest of Canada over the next, uh, you know, a couple of years. Uh, that will take time. You know, change change takes a long time until it happens all at once. Um, we're in discussions with other provinces. I think three three provinces right now how to move forward. The the, the biggest barrier is actually not technology. Technology. I, I'm I'm kind of hoping that the SSI and verifiable credentials will be will just show up and be there for the taking for these solutions. Uh, the, the, the big uh, change is really around um, uh, getting institutions ready to uh, accept this. Uh, and really where the big change is um, within a jurisdiction is to have like a single responsibility for digital identity within their jurisdiction. If we carry it by multiple departments and agencies, uh, that's fine, but uh, have like a single point of accountability. That's a governance thing. It's not so much a trust framework thing. Uh, the trust framework thing, uh, trust framework is around doing the assessments and providing the best uh, due diligence possible. Uh, lessons, again, I just uh, pulled this from one of our uh, briefing decks to the province and territories. Just, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort to do this stuff. This is not just about like throwing technology over the transom and expecting to be adopted. There's a lot of change management, a lot of relationship building. Uh, you have to get multiple staker, stakeholders involved, privacy, legal. Um, you have to uh, convey these new models and also learn um, learn from these things too. You, you go in thinking that uh, you may have the best model, the best approach and you try it and it doesn't work. And you actually have to come back and re rejig things and I guess Dave and I being editors it's been a fairly humbling and enlightening experience to uh, take the feedback from the jurisdictions and uh, wrestle with it and then try to figure out how to incorporate it into into the model uh, uh, going forward and I think we've I think we've done a pretty good job if you go up in github you will see the comment disposition. I think uh, the last round from, we had a February document and we just came out with our June document. We had, I think 180 comments that uh, took us uh, uh, three, four months to work through. And we worked through with our working group with weekly calls. And again, not saying that is perfect, but um, I think we're well along our way. And, and just to close off, you know, we're, we're, we're quite aware of like what the World Bank is doing, European Union, more recently, the Financial Action Task Force. You, you may not be aware, but the regulations for customer due diligence in um, Canada just uh, got the Royal Assent just about three, four weeks ago. We've been in, for, in discussions with them for years to get rid of like terms like original copies out of the leg, out of the regulation. So now it talks about authentic um copies, I don't know the words off the top of my head, but um, we, we paved the way or the, the way is now paved for, for, di for digital equivalents. And we're, we're taking like, you know, the notion of paper form out of, or physical manifestation out of the regulations. Uh, more info, as I said, it's up on GitHub. Um, it's, it's available under the open government license, which uh, very simply, you can use it, you can adjust it as you want, just to give proper attribution and it's free and open to apply and just with uh, appropriate credit. I just put my uh, Twitter account on there because I'm very active on Twitter and that's basically how I push stuff out. And that's about, I'm just mindful of the time, Alex, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, just coming back, um, you know, we're putting the latest and greatest that we've learned, uh, we're putting it in uh, as, a, as, a, an, uh, as a chapter, use case chapter in the self-sovereign I, I, identity book. I, I would say that the, absolute most valuable thing what SSI has done, the conversation of the last four years, it made us like step back and look at the problem completely differently. And um, 
I have, I'm very grateful for that total uh, revectoring or reframing the problem in my mind. And uh, what I felt like we're getting into like a massive dead end or into like uh, just enabling all the surveillance stuff with some like protections that didn't seem to work. We have an entirely new way of doing things of empowering the individual to present their own proofs. And I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we're not we're not 100 percent there yet, but I, I feel like the, there's a very powerful and deliberate path that's going to serve uh, serve us as Canadians, or more importantly, serve us as individuals and serve everyone globally. So with that, I th I'll hand it over to you to Alex. And do I um, hand over control to you? No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions here. And if sure. anyone wants to ask any questions, then please jump in. And um, um, first one here is from Michelle. He's asking, what is the timeline to make the PCTF, so the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, a CSA standard? I, I don't know what CSA is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's Canadian Standards Association. So uh, work that's been going on uh, with the CIO Strategy Council, they are accredited by the Standards Council of Canada. Uh, I always get confused whether it's the CSA or uh, SCC Standards Council of Canada are the ones that um, you need to provide evidence to um, to show that your standards process is uh, like above board. It's uh, ensuring that all the stakeholders are being met. Um, we just uh, finished a draft. Uh, they have a technical committee um, we, which uh, we collaborated very closely with. They basically took verbatim what we had done in the, the atomic processes and our definitions of what we call the normative core and have, have folded that into their standard. I believe it's going out to technical ballot the next couple of weeks. And um, like, I, I think they're planning to put something out by uh, the, the summertime, by August. It's a pretty aggressive schedule, which I'm perfectly fine, I'm perfectly fine with that. So I, I can't speak on behalf of the CIO Strategy Council, but <laughs> they are trying to get something out very, very quickly. That national standard that we uh, uh, that we talked about earlier. Okay, and the next question from Michelle is: um, Do you find that Hyperledger in the Aries cover most, if not all, of what the PCTF is trying to achieve? Uh, yep, but they um, that's a very specific instance of it. Um, the 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 thing that we're learning, or I'm learning, is that um, while like Hyperledger Indy and Ares and, and, and that can do the job today. And, you know, there's a specific instance of it, like uh, the Sovereign Network, for example. Um, but you can actually take uh, the approaches with verifiable credentials and apply that and use uh, kind of map your, your legacy systems in there as well. So we're pretty excited, pretty excited about um, like the, the possible options. Um, I, I would say, uh, Hyperledger Indy and Ares, uh, and, and as I said, the instance of Sovereign are really the first man manifestation of that. But uh, that's why we, and, and lots of opportunity there, but that's why we put a lot of effort into generalizing those concepts uh, that you saw, like methods and issuer verifiers, so on and so forth. And so that it doesn't necessarily um, limit us. That's the big thing I've learned uh, being in the space, policy space, is that you, you have to spend a lot of effort to make sure that you generalize the concept so you, you don't actually limit yourself. We kind of fell into that trap with PKI uh, 20 years ago. We thought PKI was going to be the way to go. We created PKI-specific policies and that, and that was great at the time, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't play out. And just making sure we don't fall into the same limitation of options. It does, it does the job great, but... Um, you never know, there may be uh, other uh, technology options that may be coming about that may be simpler, faster, more robust, don't know. But um, I think um, we're in pretty good shape, especially with the trust over IPs uh, stack there. Uh, there could be different technology options. Wonderful. And Pierre is asking, what are adoption barriers? What are individuals' feedback and feelings about all this? Well, we've only done it from the, um, the the institutions that we've been working with, the public sector. Uh, quite frankly, as far as the user is concerned, I don't think they care about this stuff. Um, they just want to be able to feel safe and confident. And I, I say somewhat glibly, um, this is about as exciting as safe drinking water. 
Um, if it works, people don't care about it. But if, uh, if if there's any problems with the drinking water, that's when you hear the issues. O honestly, I think where the adoption, um, the users, like uh, first of all, they want to feel confident. They don't want to feel like they're being cheated or that their their trust is being um, uh, co-opted for other purposes. Uh, that's one factor, which I think uh, this architecture and the approach can go a long way to uh, engendering that. As I said, governments, you know, we, we need to ensure that we have the trust and confidence of Canadians in the Canadian context. Um, but the other, the big issue, and, you know, kind of looking for industry to sort this out is how the, how the heck is this actually going to be presented to the user in a simple way? We're hearing stuff about digital wallets and verifiable credentials and digital identity. You know, we'll just, we'll just see how that plays out. But I think um, at the end of the day, a subject, an individual, wants to say, hey, it's me, this is my date of birth, I'm a Canadian citizen. They want to present it to some place in another part of the world, for example, and be able to present it with confidence and knowing that it's going to be honoured. Um, and whether it's done with a phone or, you know, a, a, you know, a chip or something like that, it's, it's really immaterial. So I think um, we just got to see how the whole, um, how the whole industry um, takes this new model and makes it simple for people. Beautiful. Um, Dramat is asking, um, the ecosystem roles and information flows diagrams so useful. Would you consider publishing them separately as a white paper, possibly at the Trust of IP Foundation? Oh man, Drummond's assigning us work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Online, yeah. so you have to commit, yeah. Yeah, I, actually, uh, Dave has uh, started to work on that to some degree. Uh, Dave, maybe you want to chip in some of the follow-on work that you're working on right now. Uh, yeah, well, as Kim mentioned, so we published uh, version 1.1, and now we're going to work on version 1.2. And one uh, big component about that is um, expanding on 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 that uh, information flow model, um, making it um, generalizable. Um, and 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 just and just having a, a more fulsome write up on, on what we're trying to get at, um, and Tim and I have discussed this. We don't think we want to just drop it into the new version of the PCTF without first of all uh, socializing it with uh, uh, all the stakeholders as well as a broader public. So. Um, I guess uh, Drummond anticipated us. We were thinking of publishing a white paper first uh, with the concepts uh, more fleshed out and uh, and then uh, seeing uh, what what kind of response we get uh, and adoption. And uh, if it goes well, then we can go back to um, our participants in our jurisdiction and say, well, this was well received. We think we should really incorporate this into the main body of the PCTF. So yes, that's the plan. Yeah, I, I think with version 1.1, we have to talk with the working group, but I think we'll put in a more um, sort of formal process for doing like enhancement proposals or improvement proposals like you see with Python and Bitcoin or RFCs and actually get a discussion document to make sure that the issues are articulated, everybody's, everybody understands that. And then with some bottom line uh, changes that will occur, like we've been doing it fairly informally but rigorously uh, up to version 1.1. But that, that's one of the things that we uh, may switch gears a little bit and just say, you know, this is enhancement proposal 001, and this is what we're talking about, and socialize that, and then uh, figure out what the what the net changes will be to either version 1.2 or may, maybe uh, follow on. So that that's something we're starting to think about more seriously as well. Albi is asking, have you considered developing some type of type of sandbox to test the SSI model and its interactions with legacy systems like IDAS Bridge? Yeah, um, a, a couple of things. Like uh, we're, we're close with the uh, Department of Homeland Security Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Um, the province of BC is has a sandbox proposal as well. We're in the process, so we finalized like six uh, participants to do what we call the user-centric uh, uh, challenge, which we'll probably put into the sandbox as well. Um, I'm, I'm kind of um, seeing that our, our other department, uh, 
innovation science and economic development will probably le lead that aspect of it. Um, they're better equipped to do that in partnership with some of the uh, the provinces like BC and that. Um, and uh, this is more around the policy and strategy, but uh, the short answer is ab absolutely yes. It's just, just making sure we have uh, it all coordinated so we get the best effect out of it. Then we have a question from one of the previous slides uh, that was at the very beginning uh, from Grenville. He's out saying, I'm assuming the validation and binding com conformance criteria will remain decoupled and the specifications will be at a technical level. Yeah, I, I think um, if that's the Grenville that I know and actually learned a lot uh, with Alberta, the other work that needs to be done is just making sure that these processes are mapped well. And then also the conformance criteria that we have, we've got them all in the, uh, the spreadsheet. That's really the, the, the technical specifications, if you will. Those may need to be adjusted as well. And we'll have to think about how to do that. Um, you know, it, it, all that detail, it's, it's tons of details and kind of like a subsidiary document to the PCTF. Um, you know, there's no reason why the conformance criteria uh, can't change because, you know, we basically develop them from existing policy and experience, but it can be completely wrong, but we can, we can fix that up. Um, in, in terms of the PCTF, if we have to change some of the wording of the processes or understanding the processes, that's stuff that would be fed up and, and be made as a change into the, uh, the PCTF. And that would probably follow up um, a process that I talked about earlier that it could be in like an enhancement proposal or improvement proposal. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think um, that's kind of the, the net of it. Thank you. Um, Carly is asking, um, why didn't PKI take off? What would be different this time? Oh, okay. Yeah. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, ba basically the mistake we made in Canada, um, we jumped to the technology too quickly and we actually have a, a, um, a, a regulation, secure electronic signature regulation on the books. And it really was very prescriptive in terms of the algorithms and that. And then basically what happened was that everybody said, oh, that's really hard to do. And so we're not going to do it. So then you got the complete opposite consequence of people just sticking with paper because the digital stuff was just too hard. Um, the, the other thing too, which PKI, um, you know, tried to address and which I don't, uh, it was nobody's fault at the time, but the notion of a certificate authority uh, basically kind of mixes up um, the notion of an issuer and uh, the the technology. It, and, it, and and in theory, it sounds simple, but when you actually roll up like uh, uh, the notion of an issuer, an institutional issuer, into like a technical certificate authority, you run into a whole host of problems and. Uh, I won't get into the detail here, but uh, basically it almost kind of paralyzes both sides. It paralyzes the tech side and it paralyzes the institutional side. And we kind of saw that in action. And um, we we basically back in 2009 uh, unwound our PKI policies because there was no um, uh, little, little adoption and we tried to make it too uh, prescriptive. So uh, the, big, the, big, the big lesson learned for us is uh, you know, never assume you think you know how this technology is going to play out or what's going to be successful. I think um, the, the the big thing, the big difference with the SSI, it basically breaks the dependency between the issuer and the verifier and puts in this sort of neutral architectural component, a decentralized ledger or verifiable data registry that you want. And it actually gives you some degree of freedom that really, you know, PKI tried to solve, but it didn't really uh, do it well. Technically, it's still the same tech um, in some ways, and you can actually do this still with like traditional X509 and JSON web tokens and stuff like that. It's really um, uh, just architecting, just making the recipe a little bit different, a little more flexible, and hopefully we can get more adoption based on that. And Pierre is asking, another challenge with businesses of the is in, of, is in the trust of data that is coming with SSI. Again, this is on the method that you explained and issues established trusted entities. How, how did they get promoted to such a role? Oh, uh, who, who got promoted? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, oh. maybe, or maybe, yeah, if you. Sure. Well, I, I, I maybe, think. 
put the following way just to make sure we get it right. And Pierre, maybe you can write this again just to make sure we get it right. And meanwhile, I ask another question, okay? Okay. If that's okay, Tim. Um, um, so the question is, um, wh why do you think, I mean, this is my question, and um, why do you think, uh, if, if you think so, that Canada has been so, so, so proactive in the identity space? Because when I look around the world, um, it's Canada seems to be very much on the forefront, um, um, especially from the government side and the provinces and, and territories. And, and then you have Europe that has been lately more active. You have Korea that is becoming more active, a little bit of Australia, New Zealand, but for, at least from, from a government point of view, but I think also in combination with the local um, companies, um, Canada seems to be on the forefront. What, what is it that makes Canada different to, to, to other jurisdictions eventually? Um, I, I think because geographically we're the second largest country in the world uh, and uh, we only have point zero point five population of the world. Um, we're very spread out and, and disparate country and regionally uh, culturally very, very different. Like uh, we're all uh, Can Canadians, if you will, but uh, your experience in Quebec is different than the experience in BC. And um, we try to figure out how to work together on this stuff. and. We've seen this with, um, uh, you know, telecommunications a hundred years ago, like uh, some of you may not be aware, but we've always been like a leader in telecommunications. That's because it drove our need to communicate across vast distance. We invented time zones. That was the other thing too with the rail. Um, and uh, just, uh, I think it's just a basically, um, it's it's a com common combination of, of factors, not not to be, like flag wavy or smug about it. It's just because, um, uh, you know, the, the, the feds, we're, we're just not in charge of everything. Like, uh, we, we have a federation, the federal government has very limited, limited powers, um, in relation to domestic issues like health and, um, uh, uh, like licensing are all provincial jurisdictions. So we actually have to figure this out in terms of values and outlook as opposed to just by fiat. So I think it's just a, it's kind of the, 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 the Canadian way. Like I view the Fed, the federal government, um, we're just one of 14, uh, 14 jurisdictions that are trying to figure out how to make this uh, work. Um, what's different about the federal um, jurisdiction is that we have to serve all Canadians. Um, um, no, I'm not saying the provinces don't, but we, we, we our, our services have to be accessible by all Canadians across the country, and a lot of our services are fairly infrequent. How often do you get a passport? Uh, how often do you file your taxes? How often do you get social benefits? So we just have a different um, uh, different uh, makeup, and so we just we're just always just trying to figure out how to synthesize those differences in a way that actually works for Canadians writ large. Wonderful. Just going to reread um, Pierre's um, um, comment. So another challenge with businesses in, is in the trust of data that's coming with SSI. Again, this is yep. on the method that you explained that issues are established trusted entities and how did they get promoted to such a role? And then he's saying, how do, he's, he would like to know how the issuers get promoted and clarifying how the, um, or who established them in the SSI process as a trusted party. Yeah, um, so that's basically uh, taking what we've developed in the normative core and putting together an assessment program for a mutual recognition process and doing the due diligence. There's tons and tons of hard work. I could do like five seminars on that. It's basically, uh, it, 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 it's really an issue of getting the parties around the table and actually working through that. Um, SSI is just one way of doing it. Um, you know, it, it, it's really doing a due, due diligence and um, having full transparency and then at the end of the day being able to provide the best advice to accept uh, or promote whatever you want to call it uh, like whether it's an issuer into a, uh, a program or service so you know that, that's a whole other uh, um, whole other ball of wax um, what what this does it actually gives you it gives you the tools to go down that path of formally recognizing each other uh, either at the jurisdictional level or it can be done at a community level or um, uh, uh, like a business organization level um, but it just it really really clarifies that and I'm happy to follow up on that uh, to provide more detail. Um, I would also add Tim uh, and, and perhaps I'm interpreting Pierre's 
uh, question. W when we talk about issuers, um, anyone can be an issuer. Uh, it's it's how well you perform the role of issuer that the PCTF assessment is all about. And and so far, we're, we're assessing issuers within the public sector context in, in Canada. Um, it's a whole other question about uh, when a bank or another private sector entity sets itself up as an issuer, um, when, if and when uh, the quality of uh, their processes will be assessed. Uh, that's out of scope for the public sector, PCTF, um, but it, it, it could eventually happen. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's the governance of the private sector. And we're not there yet. Uh, so, Alex, I, I need to jump off. I have another uh, call that I have to go on to. I'm a few minutes late, so um, uh, my apologies. I think but I, we I, have one last question from Dermot, but I think that's okay. So you can maybe jump off, and they're just going to close it down, and then I'll t um, we'll bring up the recording. Okay. Okay. Do I do, do I give you control here? Yeah, okay, that's I, okay like that. Okay, I, I got to run. So thanks, thanks for having me, and uh, uh, I'll just leave my end on, and then uh, you'll shut it down. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you, thank you, Tim, and thank thank you, Dave, also. Okay, so guys, thank you everyone who joined us today. Um, Dave, thank you so much. Dave, you want to make any final uh, share your final thoughts, or you have to go too? Uh, I, I I do have to go. Uh, um, no final thoughts other than uh, it, it's been great to be able to uh, share what we've done with uh, everybody in the uh, SSI group. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Okay, and Thank for you. everyone else, if you want to um, listen to this, just check out um, ssimeetup.org. There you can download the presentation, watch the video, and uh, I'll get it up as soon as possible. Um, next stuff we have coming up is with SpeechCrad, where we'll be talking about COVID-19 and some other things that are coming up now for June and July. So if you want to learn about all this, please just go to our website where you can sign up to, for the newsletter, go to our Telegram group where we inform people um, the first about everything, also all the other social media channels, so, um, as um, Twitter, Facebook, and all those kind of things. So thank you everyone and see you soon. Bye-bye.